After that night in the basement, I had two jobs to occupy my time. My weekdays were spent in the woods, cutting back the wild that threatened to overtake us. On the weekends, however, I worked with Terry, trying to figure out about the enemy that I meant to fight. Sometimes Susan came down to sit with us or bring us snacks, but mostly it was just the two of us in the dusty old basement. Terry, I discovered, had been doing research for years, but couldn't seem to get very deep below the surface. He had scoured the archives, the tunnels below the library, but it hadn't gotten him much. It held some old accounts of early days, some history and first-hand accounts, but a lot of the documents that should be present seemed to be gone. He didn't know where they'd gone to, but he had found some of them in his brother's private collection, and that made him even more suspicious. I have no doubt that they're in someone's private library. All Franklin has are copies, but the question is whose. After that, Terry had started doing some digging and hit bones. The Beatles, it seems, had been a big problem until the late 20s. Suddenly, pesticides had been developed to fight them, and the Beatles had stopped eating up all the crops. Five years after that, some people had started developing lung problems, and that was when the first of the cancer had been discovered in the citizens of Rayford, with a close proximity to the crops and the farm trade. Terry had figured out that the beetles, the pesticide, and the foresters were linked, but he'd hit a wall. It had been suggested that digging too deep might be hazardous to his health, and he had taken his research underground. I was the first person he had trusted enough to speak about it since, well, since ever, eh, but that hadn't stopped people from remaining suspicious of him. I don't understand how you can't just request books from whoever they are. You're the head of the historical society. You sit on the city council, for God's sake. I sit on the city council, Terry said, but it's an honorific. I'm really just there to make sure the historical integrity of the town is upheld. All the power lies with the mayor and the sheriff. I nodded, that tracked, and made a lot of sense. Those are two figures I haven't talked about much. The town of Rayford isn't huge, as I've said, but it's a town that believes a lot in the power of old money. Mayor Charles Register was part of that old money. He's been the mayor since I was a kid, and he has to be in his second decade of the job. He's a local, a high school football quarterback in his day, worked the woods with Corbin logging in between games, went to college for a little while, then came back with a law degree so he could get started getting ready to run the town. Everyone knows him, and more importantly, they know his family. The registers are an old bunch of logger barons that have been a part of the town and its politics since the founding. Four previous registers have been mayors, though not as long as Charles, and they're often mentioned in the dedication pages and the thank you speeches of those in power, where Rayford is concerned at least. Then, there's Sheriff McKenzie. McKenzie was another local staple, but for less philanthropic reasons. McKenzie had been a cop right at a high school a decade ago now, and in that decade, he'd been at the center of a number of scandals. Bad busts, bad force, missing witnesses, allegations of planted evidence, and threatened statements. The list went on and on. He was always quick to play the good old boy when the spotlight was on him, but the things he did in the shadows were what gave him his reputation. He was supposed to have more than a few lackeys in the department that did what he said, when he said it, and didn't ask a lot of questions. Even for a soldier like me, that kind of thing was damn scary. If Terry was on the radar of those two, then he had every right to be worried. After discovering holes in the archives and being told to leave it alone, he told me that he'd been asking questions for town history he'd supposedly been writing for years. Nothing too intrusive, I've assured them, but it's hard to talk about the town without the foresters. I'm also, as far as they know, 
writing a memorial book for those we've lost. That's the pretense I'm using, but in reality, it's just an effort to find something to use against the bastards. The books were there for those who might want to see them, but Terry knew that he would never actually publish them. He'd ask the wrong questions to the wrong person one of these days and end up in the woods, permanently. Whether it was as a forester or as a corpse, it hardly mattered. Either way, he would ask his questions no more. Either way, he had to keep seeming to work on it. And that's how, one Sunday around lunchtime, we came to be sitting in the living room of Ruth Darnry. Ruth had been born in Rayford in 1944, the youngest of a brood of eight. Her father had been one of those names on the town monument, one of the few to go to war and come back, and she was the last of the Darnries in Rayford. She was 65, a member of the Ladies' Auxiliary, and she had been part of something that had brought us here to talk to her today. Ruth had been a part of the hide-and-seek abduction of 62. When we get here, Terry had said as he straightened his tie, let me do the talking. Ruth is pretty open about the incident, but she's become more than a little careful about who she talks to. We were dressed in what Mom had called Sunday best, and I wondered what all the fuss was about to talk to an old lady who probably wouldn't remember that we were here tomorrow. I was wrong on that account. Despite pushing 70, Ruth was sharp and amazingly still in possession of her faculties. She had no family to live with her, no cousins or relations to help her along, and her house was well kept and free of clutter. There was none of the usual smells involved in an elderly person's house either. No faint smell of pee or perfume to hide an unwashed body. Ruth was still very independent and refused our offers to help her in the kitchen as we sat in the den. This is for some kind of book, you said? She asked, setting down glasses of tea as she took her seat. We were in the house that her parents had built when she was two, and it was a little sad to think that it would never see another darnry after her. Terry told me that Ruth had refused to marry, refused to have children, and had always been outspoken about not bringing children up here. This isn't a place for children, she would say, but not where anyone but friends could hear her. Yes, ma'am, Terry assured her. It's a memorial of sorts for those who have been lost to the forest. Would you mind telling us about the incident? She sat down and chuckled to herself as she took a sip of tea. I suppose if I did mind, I wouldn't have told you you could come here, would I? I suppose not. Terry said with a little chuckle. It was the summer of 62, wasn't it? Ruth nodded. It was midway through summer break, one of the last weeks in July, when I saw them for the last time. She swirled the tea in her glass, looking off into the distance. I became quite certain that she was time traveling, and when Terry nudged me and indicated I should turn on the recorder, I nodded and hit the button. I was playing the part of his assistant, and he was certainly leaning into the role of my mentor. It was mid-afternoon, sunset, still just an idea on the horizon, when we decided to play hide-and-seek. My cousins were over, our group now twelve in number, and my oldest brother Cliff had decided to count. We all knew not to go beyond the blue mailbox at the end of the cul-de-sac, but Everything else was fair game. We all scattered like quail looking for the best spot to place ourselves, and Clint could have probably followed his ears to most of the younger kids. He had gotten to sixty when I saw the bush beside Mrs. Yap's porch. I knew I had the perfect place to avoid getting found, and as I climbed into the middle of it, where there was a little seat of wooden branches, just right for someone my size. I didn't notice the fog until after Cliff had stopped counting, and when he started shouting for us to come in, we all thought it was a trick. 
His shouting became more frantic, his cries taking on a higher tone. And I think I knew something was different then. Clint wasn't the kind of person who got scared easily, and if he was screaming for us to hurry, something bad had happened. When my Uncle Mitch came out to tell us to come in, his voice was high and unlike anything I had ever heard from him. Uncle Mitch was a logger, and not much made him sound like that. I saw some of the younger kids break cover then and head for the house. Uncle Mitch had come out to help Clint look for us before the foresters got there, but I stayed put. I remembered the rules and knew that running was the last thing you wanted to do. The rules? I asked, my disbelief breaking my character. I didn't know the rules had been there that long. Ruth smiled wetly, her teeth mostly gone. Oh yes, even in those days the town had rules. If you were stuck in the fog, you sat down and stayed put. You didn't run, you didn't yell, and you stayed as still as a statue until it passed. That was the way of it, but I was the only one that remembered it that day. I peeked out from under the branches of my hiding spot and saw the fog bank moving across the street. It was getting thicker, covering my little bush as I sat and waited for it to stop. Outside, I heard people beginning to scream, my uncle loudest amongst them. Their childish screams were cut out one at a time, and I was left in a silence deeper than the fog around me. The fog remained for what felt like forever, and when it finally went away, the sun was just a thin line on the horizon. When I came home, my daddy threw his arms around me and said that God had seen fit to bring one child back that day. I cried with him, but I knew it wasn't God that had taken my brothers and sisters, or my cousin and my uncle. It was the Foresters, and if I gave them the chance, they would take me and any children I brought into this world. It's an odd thing to know at eight years old that you'll never have a child of your own, but it was a promise I've kept after that day. A bit of seed had been planted in me, and the foresters have only themselves to blame for the demise of my family. Rayford is not the place for children. It's blighted land, and we're nothing but cattle grazing on it till it's time for the slaughter. Terry sat in silence through the whole thing, just letting her get it all out. The ice in her tea glass rattled a little as her hands shook, and I knew that she was reliving that day as she sat hunkered in the bush listening to her family disappear. It had probably happened not far from the house, probably happened right across the street, and I couldn't imagine what it was like to live right down the road from the most tragic event of your life. Thank you, Mrs. Darnry. The names of your kin will be added to the book. They will be remembered. Never doubt it. She nodded slowly. Clint, Marjorie, Garrett, Maisie, Selina, Carter, Heath were my siblings. They'd all likely be dead now, and I think now that I've just been holding on so I could tell you this story. Gabby, Claire, Rutherford, Ferdy, and my Uncle Mitch, too. Twelve lost in a single day, one of the biggest losses in town history, really makes you think. We thanked her, packing up our recorders and notepads and taking our leave. Standing on the porch, it was easy to forget that in just eight hours, the foresters would come back out again if they didn't come with the fog before then. 
I found myself looking for the bush from her story, but I realized it was unlikely to still be there. That's how most of the stories go, Terry said. Nine times out of ten, it's tykes in the yard or kids on their way home from school. People just coming from somewhere who discover a fog bank. Lost souls who will never be seen again. Like Simon, I said quietly, and Terry nodded. We were quiet as we came back to Susan's house, but he broke it as we stood on the porch and looked at each other gravely. I need a favor, an important one. I waited expectantly, guessing what he wanted, but not quite sure I could do it. Neither your dad or your boss will talk to me about the fire of 91. I need that information. I need to know exactly what happened. They are two of the few to survive that fire. A fire that close to the source and come home. And their testimony would be worth more than all the rest. I need a first-hand account from one of them. And I need it soonish. Why soonish, I asked. Unsure what he was after. Things are in play that I don't think you're aware of. Certain timers have begun to run faster, and if they're allowed to do so, it could mean the end of Rayford as we know it. If we don't figure this out pretty quick, we may not have a home here for much longer. He left me on the porch to contemplate that, and it was heavy indeed. You're still here. Thanks so much for joining us for tonight's spooky tale. If you'd like a little bit more spooky in your life, why not click on one of the videos that appears at the end of our story? Or maybe head on over to one of our playlists where you can get your fill of spooky content. If you like your spooky a little more tactile, I've got a new book that's come out. If you'd like your own copy, there's a link below in the description where you can get your own copy of my spooky book. If you like what you see here on the channel and think you might like to support in a more monetized way, then why not come over to Patreon or become a member on YouTube? Speaking of, let's go ahead and thank our members now. Thanks to Siv Garstead, Unicorn Hollow, and Army Dude for being our spooky ghost contributors. Thanks to Janet, Lee Kendall, Psycat, Rhonda J, Sue Casper, and Valinator for being our spooky skeleton contributors. And thanks to O Snap, Hi Stacy, Winter, Zeronin, Stephanie Carrington, Tyler Parker, Cinnamon Fox, Grim Reaper, Tomboy Top Uwu, and Queen Sheba for being our ghostly reader tier contributors. And a big thanks to Scott Donahue for being our ghostly writer tier contributor. Thanks everyone. We just couldn't do the show without you. If you'd like to support the channel, then come on down to Patreon, or become a member on YouTube. Spooky Skeleton Tier Contributors, that's our $5 tier, get their spooky 12 hours early, at 8.30am, as opposed to 8.30pm, my time of course. And while Ghostly Reading is uh, only a tier that's available on Patreon, you get a signed copy of my book, anytime I write one, on your doorstep in, hopefully, a timely manner. If you'd like a book, we have many on Amazon. I've got links below if you'd like to follow those. Um, should get you to my page so you can buy any one of my eight books I believe we're up to now. I'm sure they'd look really nice on your shelf, and I'll sign them for you if you can find me out in the wild. And as always, thanks for stopping by. Dr. Plague, signing off. Have a wonderful evening.